تسليم عليكم كل اللي شاكبوا البروغرام تانا لورا في زمين البروغرام تالوم سيرين نتكلم دوار برسوناج انجليز برسوناج تولد في 30 في 23 تمارسو 1931 جوا لانجلترا بنيدا مكين براود كين انجليز بسيرو كين اسمو سير مايكل كاندو اتفال لسان يتكلم دوارو كين اسمو دونالد كامبل جيل اسم ايتوه دان لسان سكور مش فوشي اسم اللي سبيرشالمنت في سنين ستين سكور اللي نفتكروه طيب كين البنيدم اللي كسر الزوج ريكوردز ويهت تفوق الارض ولي هور تفوق البحر وسبيتشا اللي تلف حيتو تراجيكامنت قال دان لسبورتس اللي تانت كين اهوم سيرين نراو لول بارتي تا دوكومنتاريو دوكومنتاريو اللي يجيب لسان دونالد كامبل هنرا Memory is the storeroom of the mind a dusty attic of experience stacked with knowledge sometimes useless sometimes priceless once in a while we must lift the shades dust off the years and with our souvenirs seek to recapture the past for there lies reason for the present and vision for the future record holder Donald Campbell has announced that he is to attempt raising his own record over 300 miles per hour. The attempt will be made at Coniston in Lancashire, where Mr. Campbell and his father Sir Malcolm have made several attempts in the past. Donald put on his helmet, climbed into the cockpit, pulled the canopy over his head. But on this particular morning, he had a strange look on his face as he looked up to the pier at me. Travelling quickly in itself, of course, is nothing. It's the challenge. It's like a mountain. It has to be climbed. Or a song that has to be written. Once mankind ceases to have the desire to do these things and progress, well, he'll stagnate and die very rapidly. You could see it in the distance. You could hear the engine roar as it accelerated. In the plume of spray. Then almost in sort of slow motion, he suddenly, you know, it slowly began to to rise out of the water. This is the terrible part about trying to break a record. You see, you once you start, you're past the point of no return. And there's no going back. Once you start, you're past the point of no return. Past the point of no return. You see this fantastic boat just become an aeroplane. Almost as if she's soaring off into the, the wild blue yonder. Blue bird. Blue bird. Around the 
Cartwheeling over and over. What a terrible disaster. The nineteen twenties and thirties was the first great age of speed. On land, sea, and in the air, men could travel at speeds previously undreamt of. The daredevils who risked their lives to reach new milestones were seen as heroes. Britain's Malcolm Campbell was one of the greatest heroes of them all. In 1935, he faced his toughest challenge. miles an hour, five miles a minute, one mile and twelve seconds, an achievement which balks the imagination and beggars description. Breaking the 300 mile an hour barrier at Bonneville was Campbell's greatest achievement as a driver. It was his ninth land speed record. In the 1930s, his speed dreams found a new focus. He set four water speed records. Everything he touched turned to gold. Watching triumph after seamless triumph was Malcolm Campbell's greatest admirer, his son, Donald. Good, Donald. You've got the points all around. Hello, I'm afraid you've broken this old chap. I think the truth was his father was an awful old bully and a very arrogant, difficult, probably not very nice man. This is all very well, Dad, but when are you going to teach me to drive a car? Well, <laughs> when you get old enough, old boy, you can't run your trains yet. Donald had a very neglected childhood, but always he had this great hero to live up to. When you grow up with some great heroic father figure who went, doesn't really take much notice of you, things do tend to go a bit wrong, I think, and I think they went wrong for Donald. He was always trying to appease this father figure. It's a bit like something out of Hamlet. He's haunted by his father's ghost. British Movie Town News mourns the death of Sir Malcolm Campbell. Malcolm Campbell was of the race of pioneers. In another age, he might have discovered continents, but in the 20th century, it was speed which attracted his adventurous spirit. Farewell to a great patriot. When his father died, I think that put steel into Donald's heart and mind. He was absolutely determined that he was going to do things better than his father or go faster and achieve at least as much or more. He had to show the ghost of his father, that he was as much a man as his father was. Donald Campbell had never tried record-breaking before, but in 1949, in his father's old boat, he took to the water for the first time. A son takes up his father's mantle. Donald, son of Sir Malcolm Campbell, is going to defend the water speed record for Britain. He would always talk about getting the records for Britain. It was never talking about just for himself. I've heard him say many times to be born British was to win the first prize in life. But Britain in the late 1940s was no longer the greatest and fastest nation on earth. The country had been ravaged by war and a new supercharged superpower had emerged. 
the Americans were after Britain's and Sir Malcolm's water speed record. Donald Campbell felt compelled to fight for his father's and his country's honor. I believe these records are very definite, uh, symbolic of a nation's ability technically and indeed of their virility. Donald Campbell's right-hand man was his father's chief mechanic, Leo Villa. But their first joint record attempt ended disastrously. In 1950, Sir Malcolm's old boat sank. The failure spurred Donald Campbell on. He gave up his job, mortgaged his house, and poured his savings into a brand new boat. Bluebird K7, as it was called, was designed by a gifted engineer called Ken Norris. He thought outside the box. There was always something possible that others hadn't thought of. What Ken Norris and his brother Lou dreamt up was not a boat, but something truly innovative, a jet-powered hydroplane. Water is 600 times more dense than air, so if you want to travel fast over it, you've got to really get as much out of the water as possible. So you've got to design a craft that's going to ride the water, just skim the top of the water. Most racing boats were driven by propellers, but the blades created drag. Ken Norris's solution was to fit a jet engine which would blast Bluebird along at over 200 miles an hour. By 1955, Bluebird K7 was ready for a crack at the world record. If you're going to succeed, you've got to put what you're trying to do first, way before your own comfort, way before your own pleasure, and way before your own family considerations. You have got to put what you're trying to do first. first, 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 first. Donald Campbell had inherited his father's obsessive nature everything would be sacrificed in pursuit of record-breaking. I don't remember when I first met my father. Is that a funny word, met my father? I don't remember that specific moment. I can only refer to what I was told, that my mother was unfaithful to my father and he caught her being unfaithful. And he packed his bags and left, left her there and then. I don't believe my father probably saw me for at least three to four years. The enormity of what he did, I didn't grasp for a long time. I never quite appreciated the magnitude, the fame, the risks the whole shebang that went with it. Onlookers lining the shores of Lake Oswater see 34-year-old Donald Campbell take out his turbojet Bluebird on what is only meant to be a trial run with an old engine. In 1955, I was in hospital. I swallowed a hair grip. And I was recovering when someone came down to me and said, your father's just broken the, the world water speed record. And he's done it with an average speed of 202.32, a magnificent success. So that was the first time I knew anything about water speed records. Congratulations from the family and chief mechanic, Leo Villa. Now the big question, what will Bluebird do when she's flat out with her new engine? We'll be seeing. The first record was a big thing because a lot of us had put massive time and effort and 
thought into the whole thing and um, we, you, we just did not know that it was going to work. Um, and when it did, it was a big whoopee moment. This was what we could do. A small country, just recovering from wartime privations, could come up with something that could beat the rest of the world, and particularly the Americans. In the 1950s, Billy Butlin, the holiday camp entrepreneur, offered a big cash prize for each new record. Year after year, Campbell pushed his speed higher and claimed his reward. Bluebird K7 notched up record after record. The British-built speed machine became the most iconic racing boat in the world. She starts off sort of a bit like a blue whale, you know, lumbering to sort of get up onto the plane. And then once she just gets up onto her three pins and goes. Well, it's almost like a bullet out of a gun. I just think she's got very elegant feminine sort of shapes everything's rounded and curvaceous and there's no sharp angles she's so beautifully balanced and on water of course up on in her own environment it's just absolutely out of this world by the late 1950s donald campbell was a household name he was just the kind of swashbuckling hero that 1950s Britain admired. A young queen was on the throne. People yearned for trailblazers who could shape the new Elizabethan age. At Buckingham Palace, Donald Campbell, seen with his mother and Leo Villa, received the CBE. He hopes to set a new water speed record this year. The late 1950s were Campbell's glory years. He was rich, he was famous, and after a second failed marriage, he was also single. As one of Britain's most eligible bachelors, there was no shortage of female admirers. My father was a charming attractive man and you know I, th I think he, he was a ladies man he had a twinkle in his eye he was a young healthy man for goodness sake so he had a nice selection of lady friends and I suppose when I first met Tonya I suppose I just thought she was another one of his girlfriends the autumn leaves Drive by the window, the autumn leaves. I sing about love, I know what I'm singing about. His eyes, they were blue like the sky in the south of France. And they were very meaningful. You can really see what he was thinking. The first time we met, I, I knew exactly what he was thinking. Since you went away I'm very proud that this fantastic man loved me and he did. I feel he still does. I'm still his wife. I, I've never became his widow. I'm still his wife. That's the way the cookie crumble. Since you went away It was very fast, this romance. He proposed to me three days after he met me. The wedding day came and I wore bluebirds in my hair. He said, what a sweet, sweet thought. Then took my hand and kissed it. Yeah.
By 1959, Donald Campbell had six world records. On water, he had already outshone his father. But Sir Malcolm's reputation had been forged on land. If Donald Campbell wanted to emulate his father, he needed a land speed record too. While bad weather at Coniston has been holding up his record attempt on water, Donald Campbell has been considering world records on land. With Leo Villa and the two designers, he inspects a model of Bluebird 2. Well, I refer to this one as my baby. I was part of its conception. I saw it born, and it was a big part of my life for two and a half, three years. It gives me shivers to touch her now. Still, it is a very, very beautiful being. The land speed record stood at 394 miles an hour. Ken Norris designed a car that would go far beyond that to 500 or more. CN7, as it was called, was designed like a plane with an interlocking aluminium fuselage which gave the car enormous strength. She was powered by a 5,000 horsepower jet turbine engine. Harnessing this power demanded cutting edge engineering. When we were designing the car, the regulations were for the land speed record that you had to drive the power through the wheels. You've got to control them in some way and at the same time you have massive aerodynamic problems because a car can lift and flip off and take off just as easily as a boat could. At the cost of half a million pounds, CN7 was a hugely expensive car. But all the big guns of British industry lined up to bankroll the project. They were keen to associate themselves with the Campbell name and bask in the glory of a new land speed record for Britain. And things started to look good, particularly when the skin started to go on. And then you began to feel, yep, this is really going to look as, as, as we hoped it would. After four years of design and development, the 30-foot, four-ton speed machine was ready for its first public outing. That's the sound that could mean a new land speed record for Britain. The car is a magnificent animal, of course a female one, because his cars and his boats, the bluebirds, were female. When it started, it always starts slow, and then it just goes, you know, it goes. That tremendous power, it's, it's sensuous, it really is sensuous. I used to get terribly excited. By 1960, the most sophisticated car on earth was ready for a crack at the world land speed record. We're hoping that Britain will be the first to carry the world's land speed record to beyond 400 miles per hour. It's probably one of the most unique places on the planet Earth, the Bonneville Salt Flats. The fellow that made it famous was Sir Malcolm Campbell. He christened this area as a speed capital of the world, so to speak. More than 20 years after his father had smashed the 300-mile barrier at Bonneville, Donald Campbell was going to test himself on the same track. First time I became aware of Donald Campbell was a friend of mine said, hey, have you seen the new car that the British are building for the land speed record? The car thing was of real interest to me because uh, it involved the entire British automotive industry and aerospace industry, and it was a huge undertaking. And so uh, that really got my attention. I was uh, just amazed at the amount of effort that was being put into this vehicle to set a new uh, world speed record for Great Britain.
on water, Donald Campbell was the undisputed champion of the world. But this was his first attempt on land. Four American teams were also at Bonneville, each of them gunning for the world record, too. Campbell was desperate to beat them to it. So on each of Bluebird's trial runs, he pushed the speed higher. It was dawn and absolutely beautiful sun just kind of peeping through. And that moment when the canopy is actually put down over him and locked tight, he is then isolated in another world. It needs a lot of guts, I think, to cocoon yourself away like that and then press the pedal, open the throttle, release the brakes and go forward into what you really, into the unknown. He eased the car forward, and it really was just like a cartoon car, an arrow going down the salt. traveling faster than a 45 caliber bullet. You can hear the tires uh, screaming against the salt. There's the air that comes in the inlet ducts at hurricane force. This is a really, really violent, serious piece of machinery. And if you don't pay attention, if you don't do your homework uh, it's, it's going to end up biting you and uh, it'll bite you really hard he just disappears absolutely to the horizon and then suddenly this great cloud of salt came up and I thought Christ what the hell's happened and then the, the, the car emerged out of the top of the salt cloud and did it one turn over and then disappeared into the salt again. And then there was this noise, just like a tin trunk falling downstairs. I ran, I ran, I ran, and I just got there when the highway patrolman was lifting him like a dead body out of the car and then the ambulance was there but he demanded that I should sit in the front and that Leo should sit with him because he told me afterwards he wasn't sure whether he was dying or not and he didn't want me to see that. There's a little window from where he was to the driver and Leo opened it and he said Skipper wants me to tell you that the family jewels are okay. <laughs> I suppose I had survived the fastest crash that mankind has ever survived. And on the way back down to Swap, the outside wheels caught the soft salt. And the differential uh, of adhesion uh, caused the car to spin on the spin terribly rapidly. The car took off, flew for, I think, uh, 400 yards, bounced four times, and tore itself apart. Campbell's crash at 300 miles an hour was a very public calamity. His reputation as the record breaker extraordinaire lay shattered on the Bonneville salt. In the eyes of the world, and probably from within his own eyes, he had failed. And he had rather spectacularly smashed up the most expensive car that had ever been built. We met at the Dorchester in London. The only time I've ever met him when he was visibly short on confidence. He was just very uncertain as to what his future was, and indeed whether we had one. He'd smashed his skull, had a very bad accident. 
in the United States. And um, he, this had obviously shaken him considerably. But he had to do more record attempts because he didn't, he didn't have any money and it was his only means of making money. Shane McAneasy, Al Donald Campbell. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Shane Mufashli, Kollosh Bittarturi. I'm going to go to the pause. I'm going to go to the next part of the documentary. Interessant. Album Retratti, Lura Fismi, Lura Fismi, Pais Matior, Millina Fiel, Tithapet Mion, Plamatrit, Bokemnisti, Imparal Ftit, Lier Jadak Izmin Milti, Lier Jadak Izmin Milti. Yeah.